Good evening, Facebook family. Uh, welcome back. And those who are, are coming in to us via uh, Jamaicans.com. Jamaica. <laughs> Sorry, we had a little bit of a technical dif difficulty just now. But we're back. We're good. We are having, we are having an exciting program this evening for you. Um, of, of all the persons we could have this evening, we have none other than our own Jamaican, our mayor of Brad County, County no one else but... Our Mayor, Dale V.C. Holness. Okay. And so we'll be talking to him. We'll be getting to know a little bit about him and just, just casual talk. Uh, but before that, we just want to do some basic housekeeping. As you know, when you call in, please tell us where you're calling from. Just give us a reason why you're grateful today. I know things are bad. I know things are tough. But there's always a reason to be grateful. So just call in. Let us know where you're coming from or where, you, you, where you're not calling, but you're viewing from. And as I said, just let me know what are you grateful about. I'm grateful today because, honestly, I, in through all of this pandemic and COVID-19, whatever the labeling, I found one thing that was amazing. There are people who spend a lot of time, even in hardship, to give back to their community. In fact, this last Thursday, we had a food distribution in Broward County, same county that our mayor is in charge of. All the cities did so, and from what I understand, they all did, all did well. However, there's one city that I had the opportunity to actually take some photos and video. And what I like about it was the fact that people were truly happy to give back. People came out, had hundreds at the uh, Lauder Hill Sports Park, and they did a wonderful job just giving back to people. And that is something that I find very, very good. And so I just want to share a little clip that I took from that day. Uh, Kevin? I came in like 12 o'clock in the morning because I came from work and I just come in and just pass by. As, as in 12 a.m. this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Commissioner Denise Grant from the city of Lauder Hill. It is a great honor to be out here this morning. What we're doing is it's a food distribution for the city of Lauder Hill. And so we are so pleased that we have the opportunity to be able to serve our people in this capacity. It is definitely a trying time for everyone in the entire nation and actually in the entire world. And so Lauder Hill is just basically doing a piece of help extending our hands to the community in the best way that we can. Hi, I'm, in, I'm Desiree Giles Smith, Interim City Manager of the City of Lauder Hill. We are here with Feeding South Florida and a number of organizations from Delta Sigma Theta, AKA um, the Lauder Hill Chamber of Commerce. We're out here with them and they are helping us to pack bags for people who are in need. We probably have close to 700 to 800 cars that are waiting right now. All right, good morning. This is Mayor Ken Thurston of the city of Lauder Hill. Uh, we're here at our sports complex on Oakland Park Boulevard, and we have uh, almost a thousand cars in line waiting to receive uh, a food distribution. We are really blessed to have hundreds of volunteers, people who've taken out their valuable time to come and to help feed the community. Okay, Constance Stanley. Um, good morning. Uh, we're out here uh, at the uh, sports park in the city of Lauder Hill uh, doing our food distribution. I'm the chief of police of the uh, Lauder Hill Police Department, and I want to uh, thank our commissioner, Commissioner Deese Grant. Uh, for putting this together, along with our other uh, mayor and our other city officials uh, for doing this. Again, we understand the need uh, that's out there. Uh, we're happy that Lauder Hill is able to assist. Uh, it's turning out very uh, great. Uh, in fact, I kind of rolled down to see all the, uh, the uh, vehicles who are in line, and people are very patiently waiting. Good morning. I'm Commissioner Margaret Bates. I'm out here just trying to, number one, to keep safe 
and um, trying to help the community. Uh, a lot of folk are in need, and we're, whatever we can do, whatever tiny bit we can do to help support the residents, not only of the city of Lauderhill, but of Broward County, we're going to do our small part. So together we can beat this. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, the sports park here on Lauder Hill. We're doing Feeding America today. My name is Mark Saletti. I'm the fire chief, and I'm also the emergency management coordinator for the city manager. Just uh, want to thank everybody for being out here today, and uh, we're, we're here to make sure we're safe and uh, always uh, making sure that people are doing the proper PPE and making sure you're wearing your mask and uh, make sure you social distance. Stay safe, and uh, Lauder Hill Fire Department uh, is proud to be here. Thanks. So that was just a sampling of one of the cities, the many cities in Broward County that went out all out to give back. And so one of the things we realize is that even in, in time of need, people find a way to go beyond themselves. And that brings us right now to the topic of the evening in terms of just being given back. The topic is that we are more, we are more alike then we are uncommon, put it that way. And therefore, we need to find ways to, to unite. And as such, our, our mayor this evening is going to tackle that problem, not even a problem, uh, just discuss it with us from a point of view of why we need to come together. Because like you would have said, that COVID gets us all. COVID gets us all. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white or anybody else. But based on that, we need to be able to find a common ground for us all to to move forward welcome again um, mayor well thank you very thank much you. i'm grateful to be here and grateful at this point in time in my life to be of service to the people of Broward county one million nine hundred and sixty thousand wow. uh, thirty one cities you talked about the mm -hmm. food distribution uh i helped to put some of those together yeah. uh, we actually will have one to tomorrow morning nine thirty at Central Broad Regional Park, yes, where the yes. cricket stadium is, yes. from 9.30 until about 11.30. Uh, uh, and, and, and you're right. One of the things that this COVID-19 has demonstrated to the world, to humanity, that you're all humans. Yes. Okay. yes. Can you imagine a little microbe? You can't even see it. That's true. Okay. It, it's like a monster attack, att attacking the entire world. Yes. And we all have to band together to defend ourselves against this virus. Awesome. Awesome. Mayor, I, 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 I know your ego because I know that's your passion. You've said it over and over. Anybody has, has seen uh, Dale Holness anywhere, that's always been his passion to get us to come as one. But for, for you are new to Jamaicans.com. Have you ever been on the, the show before? No, I don't. No, okay. So the, the, we have people from just about all over the world. And they are, I can tell you right now, just having you here, they are proud of you as a Jamaican to be, let me guess, the only Caribbean person at, to date? To be Mayor Broad. To be Mayor Broad County, and therefore the only Jamaican <laughs> to be Mayor Broad County. That's so that's very important. So, you know, there's a little man at home in Jamaica sitting back trying to figure out where he come from. <laughs> Who is he? Okay. So before we go into any of the other things, just give me, give me a little bit of feedback as to um, where, you, where, where were you born? Where in Jamaica? Where's a little bit of um, home life in Jamaica? So I, I like to describe myself as a little country boy. I was born in the hills of Hanover, uh, overlooking Lucy, uh -huh. a place called Denava, close to Cascade. I lived in Montego Bay, in St. James, actually, in several places in Westmoreland. Uh, in fact, uh, before I migrated, I'd spend at least one month, month in all five parishes of uh, Cornwall. Uh, so that's an area that I know quite well. I migrated to the United States in 1975 
uh, finished high school here, uh, did uh, went to Broad College for a little while, uh, became got in management, uh, running as a general manager of McDonald's stores, and then I, I went into my own business as a real estate broker because I thought that was a way for us to help people get uh, to take care of themselves by creating wealth and. See. And, and building a legacy for their children that they can leave. So if I get you, you how much time you spent in Jamaica? I left Jamaica 17 years old. Yeah, 17 years mm -hmm. old. So t talk to some of those folks. What was life like at 17 in Jamaica? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some of your memories. So I, I got to tell you, the one that probably led me into politics is I met uh, Mark, Michael Manley in 1973 in a little place called Haddo in Westmoreland. Yes. Uh, 1972, actually, uh, before that election and uh, 72 election, and I thought, wow, what an inspiring person. He he just talks so much about people and how he wanted to transform Jamaica to benefit all the people of Jamaica. Uh, and uh, so, in in the 74 uh, election, the first time I ever earned any money was at as a poll poll clerk. <laughs> I don't remember how much I earned, but I can tell you what I did with the money. I bought a Bible and, a, and, and an Oxford Dictionary that I actually uh, took here with me. I had that for, for got 30 years probably until it fell apart. But uh, Jamaica was a place where people were welcoming, especially in the countryside. I heard Kinsler was a little different, but people were friendly. I mean, you, you didn't have to worry about folks stealing your stuff. And if someone did, wow. everybody knew who it was. <laughs> and we'd probably go get the stuff back from there. <laughs> you know, so, so that was the kind of, of Jamaica that I grew up uh, singing Christmas carols in the morning time, uh, five o'clock walking and singing all over town. It, it was a beautiful place. And, and I think still, probably of all the places that I've traveled to over my lifetime, Probably one of the most beautiful places that there is on earth. On earth, uh, good. Yeah, God has blessed us tremendously with that island. So give us, a, what's the reasoning for migrating? Well, you know, my parents were here. Okay. Uh, so you, you have no choice, right? <laughs> yes, that's true, <laughs> you go with that. And early life here? Well, early life here was a bit different than it is today, to be honest with you. When I came here, the Jamaican population wasn't large, not, not anywhere near what it is. In fact, the black population was not large. Uh, and if anyone knows Fort Lauderdale, Broward County, hardly any black folks live west of 441, not even in Lauderdale. Uh, not, not until the late 70s into the 80s that you saw blacks and, and Jamaicans moving all over so Broward County. Let me get this then. You, you, when you migrated, this, it was to Florida, yeah, exactly. and that's where you've been exactly. ever since. Exactly. So be, you're. Apart from Jamaica, you are a true blue Floridian. I am. <laughs> okay, I am. there you go. I am. Know, know every part of, of Florida, and especially Broward County. There's not a, uh, a crevice that I haven't been to or visited, whether it's uptown or downtown or across town, all of it. I, I, and, and, I, and I became a real estate broker. I own a real estate company now since 1988. Got my got a real estate business in 1983. So I'll tell you a little secret about that. You probably don't remember. I was the director of operations for a place called FOSI, AMI Kids. Yes. Um, I attended a church where your kids that went to, it? yes, um, ch it was West Broward Church of God. That's correct, right across um, from my office. Right, right across from my office. Yes. And I had a kid one day who wanted to, to, to get some experience about uh, some coaching. Yeah. And I asked uh, another fellow by the name of, um, gosh, I can't remember his name now. And you walked me over your office to talk to that kid. Yeah. And you were so willing that so many years ago, you still not had that heart without I knowing anything about you from then to talk to that kid. Yes. So it happened that the kid just disappeared from school before we got to him. But you still, I remember the, the, the real estate um, office. I remember your, I think at that time, you probably had an intern in there at the same time. I always had interns. Interns. I, mean, so I, I, was, I always have interns now, actually, at the county. I'm the only uh, person in elected office at the county level that really have an open door for our interns and have a whole bunch of interns. In fact, my daughter just graduated from FSU and I didn't realize that one, the student body president, Evan Steinberg, actually is an intern with my office. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it, it, was, it was something else to see the virtual commencement online 
and Evan Steinberg actually giving the, the, the student body uh, president uh, uh, speech uh, that, at that's FSU. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, so, so it's important that we help the young people. Awesome. And help guide and bring them forward because the future is in their hands more than it is in mine or yours. Uh, when, 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 when we think of what's going to happen to us when we get to an older age, what will the world be like? How would we have helped to shape and mold that world and give some guidance and directions to the youth? Actually, now you said it. You know, I could remember his name. His name was your name, Dale Davidson from yes. the church. Yes. <laughs> he yes. was a church, I think, finance person at the right. time. He right. brought me over right. there. and. Right. You always had that spirit about you. So fast forward now, we're in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And amid all the politics, amid all the, the stuff, uh, there, there's even the, the talk about that it affects us as black folks more. What's your take on that? So, you know, at the onset, I remember uh, hearing a couple of people says, well, you know, uh, COVID-19 doesn't affect black people. <laughs> yes, I remember that too. <laughs> and I laugh and say, some folks are crazy. We're all humans. Uh, so when, when we look at where we are with the virus, COVID-19, and realizing that none of us is immune, yet when you look at this country, and, and maybe in other places it might be different, but in America, when you look at the fact that there's a higher contagion rate amongst blacks, a high death rate amongst blacks. In some places, huge disparity exists. In Broward County, not as much. We are 30% of the population, about 34% of, of those who are infected by the virus are, are black, and about 36% of the death rate. But if you look at a place like Louisiana, where you, you're thinking about 70% of the folks, where, where they're only 30% of the population. That's a huge disparity that exists there. And it goes to a bunch of things. The inequities that exist within our country, and, and indeed probably within the world, when it comes to black population, minority population, uh, not enough income, not enough access to opportunities, uh, medical care is, 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 is not as open and available for them, uh, so there's a whole variety of reasons why the black community in America is affected uh, more greatly than other communities. But, but a whole bunch of it goes back to economics, by the way. Economics. Yes, a huge part of it. Because if you look at where you live in a certain zip code, you'll find that you might not have access to as many doctors or medical facilities. You, your income is probably much lower, so you don't have health insurance. Okay? Yes. You don't usually have grocery stores in many, in, in many instances within those communities. So you live in a food desert. So there's a whole history of things that adds up to where you are now in a situation where it's open, everybody sees it, and hopefully we'll address it going forward. And that's a part of what I've worked on as an elected official to ensure that we're bringing resources to underserved communities, bringing opportunities to women-owned, minority-owned uh, businesses, small businesses, uh, because I know they more directly impact those communities that have been left behind, because many of those owners are from within those communities. I, I, I hate to play the devil's advocate, but uh, it, it is said that we, some of the problems while we are affected more is because we are, we, we, our, our lifestyle and our habits, in fact, the, Facebook is full of places, guys, in the, in the height of the uh, distance in period, there's one city that had a house party. I don't know if anybody saw that, where there was a house party, yeah. and the, the, the street was pretty much blocked off by people, black folks, drinking without masks and carrying on about that. And they, uh, of course, there's a certain media uh, who would know what the subject is. So, 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 so listen, every time you look around, if you see something that is happening that is not that positive in the black community gets blown up. Yes. But you don't see what's happening on the other side. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so often, and, and, and let me give you a demonstration of something. Look at the people on the street protesting without masks, without social distancing. Mm -hmm. Are we saying, oh, these, all these white folks are out doing this stuff and it's so bad? <laughs> and it's, yes. <laughs> you know, we're not, okay? They, they're exercising their right 
to assemble into free speech. Constitutionally guaranteed. And still in those communities, we are the ones who are at a higher disadvantage. So, so here's, here's a big piece of what you have to look at also. Look at who are what now consider the essential workers in this country. Those are mm. mostly people of color. Ah. Mm. Okay. Who's at the airport when you go to push that wheelchair? Yeah. Yes. Who's there checking those bags in? Okay. Mm -hmm. Who's at the port? Who, who are interfacing at that level? If you look at our healthcare system also, look to see who those nurses are. Yes. Okay. So, so, so if you look at the people who are on the front line more often than not, it is people of color. And, and the transmission, you need to look at that also. Again, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. But, but to, to be honest with you, at this point in time, the issue is what are we going to do to fix it? So okay. that if it happens again, we're not in the same place. Okay? Which means that our policies as a nation need to deal with the underlying issues and not just pretend it doesn't exist. You look at the billions of dollars that were given to small businesses, supposedly small businesses. Mm. Okay. Yes. <laughs> businesses considered small if you have up to 500 employees. Right. Okay. Now, I wrote a, a, a letter to my members of Congress from the state of Florida that says, you ought to ensure that you are putting aside some funds directly for businesses that are less than 20 people. And by the way, in Florida, 89% of the businesses have less than eight than, than twenty people in Florida. Give okay. that statistic again, please, Mayor. Eighty-nine percent of businesses in Florida have less than twenty employees. Yet they are the ones who don't receive any funding. Okay, <laughs> yeah. because they don't have what what I learned in, in Charlotte, uh, Carolina, when we went to look at their best practices earlier this year. Social capital. What is social capital? Mm -hmm. It's the access you have to people in power and in position socially that then yes. benefits you because now you get the opportunity for job. Yeah. You, you get the opportunity for those loans. You, you get access to being told about something that's gonna happen, that's gonna be good to benefit you financially or, or even educationally. What is the best uh, source of uh, education that you should go for that's gonna bring you the most money? Mm. Wow. That's social capital. So if you don't have that social capital, okay, it means you don't get access to, uh, to, 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 to elevate yourself in your community. So that's a big piece. So policies need to be put in place that guides us in that direction. Now, I, I didn't say just do it for small business or minority or women-owned business. I says any business owner, 20 people. That, by the way, comprises greatly minority-owned businesses Minority. and women-owned business because they're smaller businesses. But some research was done that showed that if we were to remove what's called a glass ceiling of entrepreneurship <laughs> from women and minorities, we could grow the economy of this country by $2 trillion. Because entrepreneurship, as you are here, Juan, yeah. is what has actually helped to fuel the growth of, and the economy of this country and create most of the innovation that we have. Because many of those small businesses find ways to do things that are unconventional, that, 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 that goes beyond the grain and, and oftentimes discover new ways of, of innovation and, and, and doing things. So there's, there's a lot of work to do. Part of what I've done at the county level since I got there in 2010 uh, is to move from 10 and a quarter percent contracting opportunities for, for women owned minorities and small business owners from 10 and a quarter percent to now we're at about 34 mm. percent within 10 years. Wow. That's because it was purposeful. What we do is we re remove the obstacles of contracting opportunities. For example, at the airport, why do we need one contractor to clean all four terminals? Why can't well, we break that up yes. into smaller pieces so a smaller company can? Why do we require that someone be in business cleaning airports for 10 years and 400,000 square feet of space, 24 hours, seven? It's cleaning. How, how much different it is to clean the airport than to clean the courthouse, mm. right? That is true. But yet we put those restrictions in place on, on, on how you can access these opportunities, which limits you. So now we have a, a program at the airport where a portion of that is now sheltered for small businesses. Awesome. Large companies don't get a bite at that. Hold that thought. And then 30% of the bigger piece of contract also. Awesome. Awesome. Hold that thought. Kevin, yeah. want to say hi to some of our folks that's coming up? <laughs> okay. Uh,
let me get to it. These people here. For example, I, uh, well, quite a few people. Clarence Reynolds is saying, um, congratulations. Desmond Sitz, uh, uh, Smith. I love, it's a, it's a good look. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 Dr. Vadis Daly. Hello, Mr. Dale, VC Holness. I have Batista Dos Santos. Yes. Salute from, salute from him. Then there is Pauline McLean from Orangeville, Canada, in the house. Thank you. Lois Lipsitz, so I nice love, to I see an elected official uh, who cares comment. about the underserved. You want to pick up from that one? Yeah, you have one? I, love, I love that comment right there um, about the underserved. Okay. So nice to see an elected official who cares about the underserved. And, and, you know, I saw that and I was like, huh, I wonder why. Why? Yeah. Well, why? <laughs> I, I don't know, probably a little bit of my, my Jamaican-ness, that, that we, the community cares for the community, that, that you look out for each other. And maybe mm. it's a country boy in me uh, that, that is coming out. Uh, because we, we, we truly know what a, uh, it takes a village to raise a kid back <laughs> exactly, home. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's my days of being a Boy Scout uh, or, or, or serving mm. in, in student government, where I understand that collectively we can do more. And, and when someone is, is, is not as strong on your team, uh, maybe playing uh, football or cricket, you try to help the one who's not necessarily strongest to become stronger so that the whole team can be stronger. And we can win. Yes. Uh, and humanity wins when we look out for those people who are left behind. And when we strengthen them and make them stronger, they are able to better build a stronger society for all of us. And, and, and it goes to this COVID. We ought to change what we do in this world. We ought not look to see how we can build bombs and guns to fight and kill each other. And this COVID-19 virus should demonstrate to us that at the end of the day, we are on this planet together. All of us are connected. And the better we help each other, the stronger we become, the, the more prosperity we create for all our people throughout the world. We must join forces to ensure that we're making this place better for everyone. And in turn, it will be better for us. And Dante Vassal is watching and says, hallelujah, whoop, whoop. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Loving the idea. So moving forward, uh, because now we are opening up What's our current status? Because I've, I've heard so much about opening the city. What's current status as far as Bradley County, as far as opening up uh, and the phases? So there, there are about five criteria that is set at the national level for us to uh, get to where we can open. One is a reduction in flu-like symptoms. One is a reduction in, in, in um, syndromatic uh, symptoms for uh, COVID-19. Uh, another is the fact that we can handle a crisis by treating patients who might be ill uh, without going to a, a situation where we uh, uh, overrun our hospitals. The other is an, a reduction in test, positive test, uh, either as a percentage of tests being taken or as an overall percentage, so long as you're maintaining the same, same level of testing that you have. And the other one is to have robust testing available for uh, medical personnel, first responder, and everyone. Uh, we, we've met the first four criteria. The one that we haven't fully met yet and we're working on is that robust testing to where we can get into antibody testing also to identify where the virus has been in the community and where there might be hot spots. Uh, we're working on that. In fact, uh, starting Monday, we're going to do home visit for homebound people. Uh, we've stood up more testing sites in Broward County just this past week. We did one. Uh, in the city of Fort Lauderdale, we now have a total of uh, five testing site drive through and two drive up. So testing has become far more available. We're working with one of our universities to do the uh, antibody testing as so, so soon as we get the, uh, the allotment from the state for those tests. Uh, we've started to loosen because we've seen a flattening and a decline in the number yes. of new uh, tests. We are about 5,300 now in Broward County as of today. But what we've seen over the past several days is a drop from where we peaked at about 232 
to where we went down to as low as 39 about three, four days ago, new tests, new, new positive tests. Uh, and it bounced up a little bit to about 100. So it's, 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 it's doing a little bit of that, but we're way down compared to where we were before. With that in mind, we can, and, and people are practicing the social distances yes. uh, and, and the protocols that would help reduce the spread of the virus. So we're in a good place when it comes to that. Uh, so we've opened our parks, we open golf courses, we open boat ramps. Uh, we, we're, we're now in discussion, and I'll have a, uh, I'll call a meeting uh, come Tuesday evening with all the mayors of Broward County. There are 31 different municipalities in Broward County to have further discussion as to what they see as where we ought to be going. I've already spoken to a couple of the mayors and they want to see us open uh, some more uh, uh, businesses in, in Broward County. And, and we're looking at restaurants probably at anywhere from 25 to 50 percent capacity with social distancing and probably allowing some flexibility that they can use a parking lot space to have outdoor dining that will help them uh, get to where they need to do. Uh, or barbershops, beauty salons, a lot of, uh, of uh, ladies Please. are telling me that it's, it's now a, 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 an essential <laughs> service. <laughs> it's, now, it's now an essential service. And if you can see my afro uh, that I pat down a little bit, uh, I haven't been in barber in a long time since we shut down either. So there, there are a lot of us who, who need that service. But, but overall, if we continue to see the decline that we've seen, if people continue to behave the way they have, and with so, ensuring that we are not spreading the virus, then we can open up a little bit more. And so that brings me to the next thing, because there's a, there, there's a little bit of, there's a word that so we need to be cautious. We need to be extremely cautious, yes. because uh, as soon as the summer is uh, um, gone, there is a tendency for a spike. So the it's question is, what are we doing as a, as, as, as a county to, to make sure that once we're opening up, we open up with a sense of caution? Yeah. So, so we, we're, the whole thing to is to prevent for, that spike. The whole, the whole thing for us to open is to phase it in and not to just go open, uh, letting everybody out and going back to the old ways that we used to. Th those norms are not going to be around for a long time. People are going to wear masks for a long time. People are going to socially distance for a long time. That was People my are going to wash their hands more you. often. Yes. So those protocols will, main, be, will still be in place. And in fact, I tell you this, if we had started taking those measures, from say January when we realized where it was, we wouldn't have the kind of spread that we have in this country. Okay, so if if the guidance was there from a na on a national level, that hey, be alert. This is a possibility. It could be coming to your neighborhood. Here's what you need to do to prevent the spread, and we could take actions from them. We should have. We wouldn't have had the kind of spread we have at this point in time. So there's another piece to it that needs to be done also before we get to where we open. We have to have a capacity to what's called trace, tracing. That okay. means if, you, if we find out that you're ill, like, testing becomes readily available. You need a test, you get a test right away. And then we need to trace the people that you've been in contact with and isolate them from the rest of society so that they're not spreading the virus. If we are able to manage that well, if we see a new case somewhere, we can get on it quickly. And if you look at Broward County numbers, by the way, you'll find that we appear to have been the first place to have it. I don't think so. I think Miami probably had it as early as we did. They just didn't catch it and were testing as quick as we were. So we tested more, and today Miami-Dade County is over 12,000 cases. Sure, the population is 2.7 million. We're 1.9 million, but we're only at 5,000. So they're more than twice, about two and a half times what we have. Wow. Okay. Because we were testing early, we were tracing early, we were isolating it early. Like you said, it's our peers. It, exactly. Right. So, 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 so it is critical that we do uh, phase this in and that people continue wherever you are in the world. When I tell you this, the, the, there's no normal no more. There's going to be new norms in this and world. That's what I'd like to ask you. What's, yeah. As we move forward and we attempt, we attempt to be... Uh, like you said, we have to be more united. What do you vision the new normal to be? And I want to say with a view that there are people, not just Florida, because, uh, uh, for example, what can people take from your knowledge on an international level for a guy in, in Jamaica watching or someone in Canada or anywhere else? What would, that, what would that normal be moving forward? What some of the things you would suggest to them that they be mindful of, of all time? So, all so what we've found is this. 
the spread of the regular flu is more contained than it has ever been. Why? Yeah, yes. Because people are washing their hands more often. Uh -huh. They're not touching their nose and their mouth as much. As much. Or their eyes, okay? And that's a primary way that that flu is transferred. People are not being so close to each other either, where you cough or sneeze or where you speak and it get transmitted. That's why the distancing is required. So because all those folks used to talk it up in your face. <laughs> those and, and grab you and shake your hand and hug you. You're not going to see a whole lot of that anymore. That's, that's what you're going to see different uh, going forward. Uh, well, let me ask you, sorry, Mayor. Let, yes. me, let me jump in here and ask you this. So with the distancing and the reduction in things like the flu and such, the whole idea of developing immunity, whether it be herd immunity uh -huh. or individual immunity, well, that comes, that develops into herd immunity. Mm -hmm. Is that out of discussions altogether? No, that's one of the reasons why we want to do the antibody testing, because when you've overcome the virus, they're, they're, it's still within your blood right. uh, is, is that antibody that fought off that virus, Right. where you probably showed no symptoms because your immune system was so strong to attack it and beat it early. Right, because there are asymptomatic individuals. A lot of people are asymptomatic. In, in fact, I'll tell you this, people are gonna be alarmed on the other side of this to find out the amount of people who actually truly had this virus that well, didn't know they have it. Yeah. By the sampling that's being done now is telling us that. The scientific mm -hmm. sampling, when you go out and do the right demographics wow. and the right uh, sampling, it's already showing that a lot more people had the virus than we thought. So not yes. just so what we're looking at now is you see those numbers says those who have been tested positive for it. Yes. Right. That means you took a test and it showed you had it. Right. But you could have had it, never took a test, and it passed. And you don't know when you it, had it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So so that's that's something that's that's gonna alarm a lot of people when you see it's not a million in the United States. Maybe it's a million and a half. Maybe it's two million. Right. And then you're going to also look at the, the number of people who died as a result of this virus. The number is going to go up high all, higher also because many people died today and they thought it was something else. I mean, probably from as early as January, people were dying from this. And nobody was really paying attention that, hey, it could be this because we never thought it was here yet. Right. Okay. And, and, and probably in other parts of the world similarly. So, yes. We, the vaccine is being fast track and, and that's what vaccination does. We don't have polio anymore, pretty much, because of, of vaccination, because basically what you've done is you've inoculated the world in such a way that the immune system in individuals are not able to fight the polio uh, yes. uh, virus if it, it should attack, attack someone, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's gonna be a lot of, of, of immunity spread mm -hmm. out throughout the world. So if it comes back, it won't be as aggressive in terms of the spread uh, than, than we see today. I won't get into too much about the whole vaccination and creating of the immunity by that method because then that's a whole nother show oh, and a is. whole lot it of is. time. It is, it is. So, well, let, thank you. Yeah. Let me just jump in because there's some people who are watching um, that of course, um, Gerald Chambers says, hello, Mayor Ahonis, doing a great job in Brad County. And of course, we want to just say hi to the birthday man himself, uh, our CG, Oliver Mayor, who is watching. He put down some, I don't know if you saw it last night. Well, <laughs> it's <laughs> it something did. Uh, he put down some dance last night and we, we had fun. That was a good thing. Yeah. William Stewart is watching too. Mitch, hey, Mitch, how you doing? Claude at the Paz is there. Francis Reed. And uh, Miss and Hastings is watching. I want to take a little time out because I got a call from a lady. She, she will be 90 in October wow. from a little place in Hobson City, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, I put my, but they never call me. So I, I, I don't see her now, but Rose, uh, Rose Bailey, Miss Rose Bailey, Mama Rose Bailey, a uh, happy Sunday to you and welcome to Bar Talk. <laughs> and happy birthday <laughs> when it comes. When it comes. When it comes. <laughs> Actually, you had a birthday not, not so long ago. Yes, April 2nd. April yep. 2nd. Yeah. Yes, it's just around the corner. 
Uh, I want to say a big up to, to Sherry Sutton. Sherry Sutton. Bless, blessings, Mayor, Mr. Mayor from TWC. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> your your, your, your connections. Yes. Okay, good. So, moving forward, a year from now, six months from now, mm -hmm. can we actually truly lick this thing? Mm -hmm. We will. We will. Yeah, I'm, I'm very positive that we will. Um, uh, this, is, this is not the first pandemic that we've faced on and, and, and beaten. I think humanity will rise to the challenge uh, and, and we will beat this virus. Uh, not to tell you that we won't see any of it ever again, but I believe that the kind of chaos that uh, this coronavirus, COVID-19, has caused, uh, within a year from now, you won't ever think that we were as bad as it is today. It is. Yeah. Good. Uh, partly in b because of uh, the science as we go forward that we're learning how to deal with this issue, uh, antiviral uh, concoctions that will be made available to people to deal with that. You, you remember AIDS, I mean, that was a death threat to people. Now people are living full lives uh, because science, uh, the, the blessing of God to uh, allow us to, to find those cures uh, or those treatments uh, was made available. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, this is one that you can build some immunity to, uh, that seems to be there. Uh, not clear exactly how strong that is, but, but I believe there's some of it. The science shows that. Uh, the fact that we will probably end up uh, finding a vaccine uh, to, to be able, I know a lot of people don't think vaccine is a good thing, but it works for polio. Yes. It works for, for, for a whole bunch of different items. And, and a lot yeah, of us got it back home when we were growing up. There's some challenges to it, and, and people are uncomfortable with it, but at the end of the day, if you look at the science. Vaccines that work are an excellent thing. Yeah, yeah they, they, they have. So, so, so we'll go through some experimentation. And, uh, and we'll move over, forward. Over time, we'll move forward. Uh, the world is likely to be different a year from now. A year from now. We're going to find a lot more people working from home. Yes. You're going to see a lot more mm. teleconferences rather than people conferencing. Uh, in the same place. You're segue to, segueing into something that I, every week I do something or say a shout out to a certain set of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned working from home. Mm -hmm. And I just want to interject because we have made our, 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 our shout out to the nurses. We've made our shout out to the people in the, the uh, frontline folks. Mm -hmm. they, and so today I'm just going to put up this book here. And I'm just going to put, the, I don't know why I have these apples. It's for the teachers? For, <laughs> <laughs> teachers. And uh, yes. I just want, yes. what, once you mentioned the book, I don't necessarily want to show the author, but it says, your best life now. And to be quite honest with you, I had, thank you, Loretta Dees, for giving me an opportunity to sit beside her as she went through one of her Zoom classes. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you something. If you think a, a, a troublemaker at school is gone, no, he's a troublemaker online. <laughs> online. <laughs> I don't want to call the fella's name because I don't want to make the trouble. But that fella, there, the, the 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 thing about it, we so we we have kudos to the parents. I know you are actually losing your minds having to deal with these kids uh, so often. Kids, for those who are hanging in there, kudos to you for staying online, for doing your work when you don't have to do it. And definitely for the teacher like the teachers like uh, Loretta Dees, I thank you so much. I sat there and I watched some of the kids. Some of the kids don't want to show their face. Some of them left the thing on, and, but then there are kids who want to work. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about it is that the kids who want to work, like in a regular school, will work, and the kids who don't want to want to be just, and so actually a good thing from her class with the parents' help, some of the kids' grades have increased because they're, and they're, some of them are calling teachers at nine o'clock at night, mm -hmm. uh, Miss so-and-so, I didn't get this, Miss so-and-so, I didn't get this, so that aspect of it is a good sign. So maybe, I don't know, if the school term might be into, you know, uh, I don't know if that's possible, 
but but a little bit of this online tutoring with kids it's just something but uh, that's something else to be seen well, we're going to see a lot more of it as, uh my daughter uh, as i said graduated from fsu yesterday the commencement was online online okay you're going to see a lot more learning online working online uh, and 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 it probably help us also with the environment because then you won't have that many people traveling and consuming as much energy. That's true. Okay, so, so, so th th there's going to be, I believe, you know, that in often bad things, some good comes. Good comes. Uh, if you look for it, if you work towards it. And I think that humanity will find some good uh, out of this. Uh, I mean, yes, it's a horrible, terrible disease uh, that kills folks. Uh, but at the end of the day, I believe that we can use this as lessons learned. Let's learn. To build a better world for all of us. And that is a perfect way to wrap up this segment of Bar Talk uh, on Jamaicans.com. Unless you have something else, Kevin. Oh, no, that's, a, that's another show. That's another show. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Mir. Uh, VC Wholeness. Yes. For uh, Dale VC Wholeness. Thank you. Your brother I know for so many years. A man of God, just so you all know, you know um, for being here and just being yourself and just being so casual. And Jamaicans, uh, we need to be proud. I know you are proud. You guys have been saying this through this. We are so proud to have him. And I hope today, and just his upbringing and where he came from, and just some of the things that he has said will inspire you. Next week on Bar Talk, is Mother's Day special edition. It's called Mama's Boy. <laughs> it's an it, it's a tribute to all the mothers who fathers uh, fathered us. So please, like I've asked you before, if you have a picture of your mom and you're your mom together, if you were raised by your mom and you didn't fare out too bad, like <laughs> yours truly, I think. <laughs> Please send me that picture. Kevin is laughing because he is one of them. And, and I'm one also. <laughs> I want those there. Okay. Please send a whole lot of us. A whole, lot, a whole yeah. bunch of us. We hope to have some special guests and we're working on it. it, it we, we, we're hoping it will be a fantastic show uh, without any glitches. Please stay tuned. Thank you for being part. The and best I send part. flowers uh, to all the mothers. Ah, here you go. <laughs> Thank you for being part of Bar Talk.